Ben, what a great day it's about to be. Starting a brand new series. I love starting new series. And this one's going to take us all the way through Easter. Easter, we're going to end with limitless love. You don't want to miss that. What a great day it's going to be. But I want to talk to you about how to live limitless and what it means to live limitless. Now, let me tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to preach you through my book. I'm not going to go chapter one. We're not doing that. You can get the book, 21st, 28. We're giving it to you for free. How many of you know if it's free, it's for me in Jesus' name? So you can get that free. All you got to do is be here. And if you're watching online, you get a coupon code. I mean, how th- I love being a part of a generous church. It's what I love. And so uh, you can read through that. But I do want to talk to you today, uh, really a foundation of how do I live a limitless life? Well, Ephesians 3.20, take the limits off. Somebody say that with me. Take the limits off. Ephesians 3.20, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that which I could ever ask or even think. I knelt down to pray the other day and I realized something. Everything I've prayed for, God's given it to me. But he's never given it to me at the level I prayed for it. It's always been more. And so as I was praying, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and said, well, if he's given you everything, then why don't you just ask him for more? Why don't you start asking bigger? Maybe you're playing it safe, Eric. Maybe you should start dreaming bigger dreams and taking bigger risks. So I've been praying some really big prayers lately. And I'm believing God's going to show up and exceed anything I could ever ask or even think. That's how you live a limitless life. Now, Psalm says something else. The book of Psalm says that the children of Israel... They limited God in the wilderness. They actually, they provoked God, they vexed God, and they limited him in the wilderness. The word limited in Psalms means they caused God pain. Do you realize when you put limits on God, you actually cause him pain? A God who spoke planets into existence, a God who hung stars on nothing, And they spin at such a perfect rotation that we set our clocks by the spinning of the stars. I mean, everything, and the universe is still expanding exponentially so fast that science scientists can't even keep up with all that's going on. That's just space, folks. There's never been two fingerprints alike because God never comes to the end of what he's doing. And what he's saying to you is, if I'm still creating new fingerprints, What do you think I could do in your life? Don't limit me. Limit your problem. Limit the devil. But don't you dare put a limit on God. When you limit God, you cause him pain. So how do we begin to live this limitless life? I'm going to take you through. It's what you could consider the beginning of Jesus' ministry, his public ministry. And when, when when God announces him to the world and He begins into this ministry, and what you're going to see is he's going to go through a couple stages, and ultimately he ends with limitless. And I want to talk to you about how we get there living the limitless life, because I want you to live a limitless life. Luke chapter 4, if you want to turn with me, Luke chapter 4. Now let's talk about what happened just before we get to Luke chapter 4. This is that encounter of Jesus and John the Baptist at the Jordan River. John the Baptist is baptizing. That's why he's called the Baptist. He's John the Baptizer. And he's baptizing in the Jordan River. He begins to tell the people, he said, I baptize you with water, but there is one coming after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And the Bible says, and as he was speaking, he looked up and there was the man he was talking about. And he told all the people, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, what's so powerful about this is every sacrifice for sin up to this point only covered your sin. But when Jesus died, he took your sins away. You say, what's the difference? Well, if I got a stain on my carpet and I put a rug over it, you can't see the stain, but it's still there. But if I get something to take the stain out, better yet, if I just go ahead and replace the carpet, It's as if the stain never existed. 
That's the difference between what lambs and goats and rams did and what Jesus Christ did. He doesn't cover your sin. His sin takes it away. In fact, he makes you brand new as if you never sinned before. Now, when Jesus was baptized, the Bible says as he came up out of the water, the heavens open and the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. And there was a voice that spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, dad, pay attention to that. Jesus had never turned water into wine. He had never healed the sick at this point. He had never restored blinded eyes, but yet his dad was already bragging on him. There's something powerful about the blessing of a father. Don't wait until your son becomes a professional athlete to be proud of him. Be proud of him when he's striking out in the t-ball. That's my son. He may strike out, but ain't nobody strikes out like my son. You know, my daughter, most beautiful daughter in the world, talented daughter in the world. Well, has she, is she doing any, any sports yet? No, she can't even talk yet. She's only a year old, but she's my daughter and she's the greatest thing in the world. Fathers brag on your children. It has power, great power. So now Jesus, we pick up in, in Luke chapter four, verse number one. Let me just prepare you. I'm going to take my time today. My, my goal is not to scream at you. My goal is to help you receive this revelation so that you can begin to live a limitless life. You will never live the limitless life as long as you are bound to temptation. Until you get victory over temptation or learn how to flee and resist temptation, you will never experience a limitless life. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. Pay attention. He is full of the Holy Ghost. He is being led by the Holy Ghost. We don't like the next three words. In the wilderness. Who led him to the wilderness? The Holy Ghost. Now, hold on. I thought once I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I thought when I got saved and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't have any more dry times. No, it could be the Holy Ghost leading you to dry times. You'll see why here in just a moment. He is led by the Spirit for 40 days being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during, this, during these days. And here's the most obvious verse in all the Bible. And when they were ended, he was hungry. <laughs> 40 days not eating, Jesus is hungry. 40 days. Who led him into the desert? The Holy Spirit. When did he lead him into the desert? After a high moment. He's come out of the water. The Father's bragging on him. The Holy Spirit's descending on him. And then he takes him into the desert. Pay attention to your high moments. Because there's usually going to be something you're led through after a great victory. It's a process. You're going to see it in just a moment. It was the spirit that arranged the attack. Do you think God knew that the devil was going to tempt him? Of course he did. God knows all. But the spirit led him to a place where he would be attacked by the devil. So the spirit arranged the attack. Why would the Holy Spirit lead me into a place where the devil's going to attack me? It's kind of like God leading the children of Israel out of Egypt only to put their backs against the Red Sea between two mountains and Pharaoh coming on the other side. Who led them there? God led them there. Could it be that God leads you into an attack to reveal what you're full of? I've met a lot of people who are full of it. Now, I've met some people who are full of the Holy Ghost. And I've met some people who are full of something else. And all it takes to reveal what you're full of is all it takes to reveal what's inside of an orange. Squeeze it. And the moment I squeeze it, I see what was really on the inside of you. I know you talk a good game when you get in church. You know, limitless, limitless. Let's put, you in a, let's put you in a storm. See if that praise is still coming out of you when you get in a dry place. 
That's when I know you're limitless. He's in a place of preparation. What's the preparation? It's a place of denial and temptation. Denial and temptation. These exist together. Denial, temptation. Temptation is feeding. Living by the Spirit is denying. He is in a place of denial. He is not eating for 40 days. What's he doing? He's fasting. Why do we fast? To kill the flesh. What does temptation want you to feed? The flesh. What does the Bible say you're to live by? The flesh or the Spirit? Live by the Spirit. So I'm, it, the only way I can live by the Spirit is I have to deny the flesh. If I deny the Spirit, I feed the flesh. In other words, if I don't deny the flesh, then I feed temptation. So denial, temptation. Our problem is we've re raised a generation who knows nothing about denial. Now you're going to think this is a sermon for the youth group. This is not. Because we're, we're at a place in our culture today that if you're 60 years old, you've not been denied too much. And under that, they've been denied even less. We don't say no to anything. You want to live a lifestyle? Go for it. You want to believe you're something you're not? Go for it. There's no denial. You know, don't deny the flesh in anything. Hey, if you want to buy something and your wallet tells you you can't, you just check with MasterCard. And then you get whatever you want because we know nothing of denial. We know nothing of delayed gratification. We've got to have it now. That one commercial summed it up for all of us. I want my money and I want it now. And then when truth is presented to us, there are two things that happen when truth is preached. Either the flesh or the spirit will respond. Whichever one is louder is whichever one is in control of your life. You're not supposed to like every message I preach. What? Who ever said you're supposed to like every sermon I preach? I don't like everything that's in the Bible. Oh, I love everything that's in the Bible. No, I don't. I don't like all that turn the other cheek stuff. I don't like that give away my coat. I don't like that forgive those who mistreat you and misuse you. I don't like any of that. But I have to receive it because when I do it feeds my spirit and it kills my flesh. But if when truth is presented, the flesh rises up, we know how to respond when we're talking about little children, right? When you tell a little child no, we know how they're going to respond. They're going to bite, they're going to pull hair, and they're going to spit up on you. Why? Because they're little children. The problem is when you're 45 years old and truth is presented to you and you start biting, backbiting, and then you start pulling hair, you start pulling people down, and then you start spitting up, you go around gossiping saying, he ain't right. You're acting like children. Because your flesh is in control of your life. You ought to be led by the Spirit. Led by the Spirit. And then you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So I'm trying to get you free from the flesh. How are you going to live a limitless life if you're controlled by your flesh? You can only live limitless when the Spirit is in charge of your life. Here's a big idea. Resisting temptation produces anointing. Do you want to be anointed? The more temptation you say no to, the greater anointing you walk in. Every time you give in to temptation, your anointing goes down. Whenever you resist temptation, your anointing goes up. Here's a big idea. Purity in private results in power in public. If you want power when you get in places like this, you have to live pure when nobody's watching. Our problem, and I'm gonna get ahead of myself, our problem in the church today is we have no discernment. We mistake gift and talent for anointing. So when a person can craft a good message or when they can sing and hit all the runs and hit all the keys, we think they're anointed. No, they're talented. 
It's not anointed until people start getting set free from the runs. People get set free from hitting all the keys. People get set free from the preaching that's going on. See, what changed when they preached? If you went out the same way you came in, that was a gifted message. It wasn't an anointed message. When the anointing is present, chains are going to break. You're going to read this in Luke chapter 4. The blind see, the deaf hear, the bound are set free. That's what happens when the anointing shows up. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It does not say where there is talent, there is liberty. So we've got to differentiate in what is talent and what is anointed. You only walk in the anointed when you live with purity, when nobody's watching. Here's, I'm going to walk through this with you. So what, this is what we're going to do for the next couple weeks. So don't miss a week. We're going to talk about living the limitless life. Here's, here's the path we're going to go down. And this is, this is what you're going to see in Luke chapter 4. It begins with temptation. Temptation is going to lead you to timing. Timing is going to lead you to trial. Okay? Temptation produces anointing. Timing reveals your purpose. Trial, this is exciting, here's limitless, leads to promotion. This is limitless. This is where God opens doors that no man can shut. This is where man rises up against you and tries to stop you, but because you're walking in your purpose and you're anointed, nothing man can do can stop you. This is where, this is where Psalm says, God is on my side, I will not fear, what can man do to me? That's limitless, that's the limitless life, but I can only live the limitless life if I'm walking in my purpose, and I can only walk in my purpose if I have the anointing. I can't fulfill my purpose without the anointing of God on my life. So temptation brings anointing. Timing announces purpose. Trial initiates, a pro, pro, trial initiates promotion. Temptation always precedes trial. Temptation is not trials. You have to be anointed to make it through trials. You do not have to be anointed to make it through temptation. Making it through temptation brings an anointing on your life for the trial you're about to go through. See what I'm saying? Temptation is going to reveal something that's on the inside of you. Deal with it so you can walk in the anointing. Trial is something that comes against you to stop you from walking in your purpose. These are two different things. Now, temptation is all about what I want. Trial is the things I don't want. See, when I'm dealing with temptation, I'm having to resist things that I already like. When I go into a trial, there's nothing about a trial that you're like, oh, I like this part. <laughs> Everything about a trial you hate. But if you can't get victory over the things you desire, you will be crushed by the things you dread. So I want you to get victory over these fleshly desires. Temptation is announcing, I'm about to step in to my purpose. The reason these temptations are coming against me is because God, watch. If this is promotion, if this is platform, if this is wilderness, this is I'm by myself, nobody else around, me and God, and the devil shows up. God wants to deal with it in private instead of it having to be exposed in public. 
See, if you can get victory over temptations in private, you won't have to endure the shame and embarrassment of having to deal with them in public. That's a problem with a lot of preachers today. Oh, we're, we're getting into this. Are you ready? There's three ways that sin hits us through temptation. James talks about it. This happened in the Garden of Eden. This happens in Luke chapter 4. Watch this. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. Lust of the flesh, passion, sex, food, opinions. Lust of the eye, possessions, salary. Pride of life is the temptation to be. It is position. It is status. This is the pride of life. James 1, here, this ought to encourage somebody. James 1, 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured away and enticed by his own what? Desire. This is my dread. These are my desires. Temptation does not come at you with things that you hate. It comes at you with things you already love. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to a monster. Sin. Sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. That's what I've got in the cage. This thing is either dying or this thing is growing. It's up to me whether or not I feed it or starve it. Oh, we're going somewhere. How does temptation work? It begins with a thought. Thought leads to imagination. Imagination leads to justification. Justification leads to choice. Choice leads to sin. All temptation begins with a thought. Martin Luther put it like this. You can't keep birds from flying over your head, but you have a choice whether or not to let them build a nest in your head. I can't keep tempting thoughts from flying over me, but I can choose whether or not I bring that thought and let it build a home in my head. Once it comes down and starts building a nest, that becomes an imagination. Now I start playing out scenarios. Now I know what you're thinking. You're immediately going to the sexual. You're thinking lust and temptation. You begin to think these lustful thoughts, and that's true. But you can also think hateful thoughts. You ever murdered somebody in your mind? Come on, tell the truth. Think about it. You ever murdered somebody? I hate them so much. Oh, I dream of them. I can see them in a car wreck. I can see their car blowing up because I put a bomb in. You ever had those thoughts? This is... This is imagination. Now be careful. Because the Old Testament, for those of you who are like, the Old Testament's so tough. Okay? The Old Testament said you had to do it to be guilty of it. Jesus shows up and says, all you got to do is think it. In the Old Testament, you had to actually commit sexual immorality with a woman to be guilty of it. And under Jesus, all you got to do is imagine. And you're guilty of it. Now this imagination gives birth to justification. You begin to come up with all the reasons why you're allowed to do it. Yeah, but I found this little place in the Bible that God understands. I got a little weakness and God understands my family and God understands generational curses. God understands I, uh, this isn't my fault. It's my daddy's fault. It's my grandfather's fault and all this kind of stuff. God, God understands all this. And you begin to justify your actions and justify your sin. This leads to a choice and the choice gives birth to sin. I'm a Christian pastor. I shouldn't be tempted. To be tempted is to be human. Temptation is not sin. Let me say that again. Temptation is not sin. Giving in to temptation is sin. I wish I'd never be tempted again. You're wishing you were dead. You're going to be I heard a story of a young man. He was talking to an older preacher. And he asked this older preacher, he said, he said, sir, he said, when will, when, will I, when will I not have to deal with temptation anymore? And the old preacher looked back at him and said, well, I don't know, I'm only 85. <laughs> See, you're not going to outgrow temptation. You're not going to get to a place in your life. You're not tempted anymore, but you can walk in victory. Coming to Christ doesn't mean the absence of temptation. It means declaring war on the temptation that's already there. 
I'm going to declare war on temptation. This morning, we moved ahead an hour. Thank God for that, right? I mean, of all the stuff they're passing in Congress, can they please pass a law that stops the forward, backward, forward, backward? Can we just stay forward? We ought to petition Congress. This is what we really want. Keep the stimulus money. We just don't want the time to change. Anybody who's okay with time change has never raised a kid. So, <laughs> so this morning, I woke up late. Not because time changed. I woke up late because I forgot to set my alarm. Now, I almost missed out on my timing because I forgot to set an alarm. What I want this message to do today is to call some people, set some alarms in your life. Pay attention to the temptation in your life. It could be that one little thing that's holding back you walking in your purpose and you stepping into your timing and you being everything God created you to be. But it's time to set some alarms and wake up. Somebody shout, wake up. All right, let's do this. Verse 3. The devil said to Jesus, if you are, pay attention to those three words, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Jesus answered him, pay attention to these three words. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. In another version it says, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So what's he saying here? First off, here's the lesson that Jesus is going to teach us. Don't think you can whip temptation in your own ability. You're not strong enough to withstand temptation. None of us are. The only way you overcome temptation is you've got to whip the devil with the word. You better know the word of God. You better know what the Holy Spirit sounds like. And when he talks to you, you better know his voice and pay attention to his voice. Now, what is getting ready to happen here is we're seeing the lust of the flesh. This is passion. Remember, temptation rides natural desires. Think, think of a sex for a moment. Natural desire. What does temptation do? Pulls it out of its timing and pulls it out of its purpose. That's the sin of sexual temptation. Out of time, out of purpose. When, 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 you, when you engage in that in its right timing and its right purpose, God blesses it. When you engage in it out of its time and out of its purpose, God curses it. This is temptation. Natural desire. We have a whole table of hostess up here today. I promise you, you give me a couple days, I could take this whole table down. I might be gnawing on the table by the time it's over. We've got ho-hos up here. We've got cupcakes up here. That's the good stuff. We've got Twinkies. Have you seen that you can get a Twinkie wedding cake? Kim didn't tell me this. And then we have these White powdered donuts. I don't know what the white powder is, but I'm addicted. I see that. I hear that bag starting to crinkle when I start getting the shakes. Like, hey, give me one of them donuts. When me and Kim first got married, my pantry was full of hostess. You know what wasn't in there and what wasn't in my refrigerator? Broccoli. You are not going to find broccoli in my house. Don't even accuse me. Don't you spread rumors that I'm eating broccoli. I will fight you over that because I do not eat broccoli. Now, hostess, I might be guilty. I might be sneaking. You might find, you might go through, find a little cabinet in my house that Kim don't know about. And there might be some Twinkies in there. I don't know. This was my temptation. And what was funny was I started putting my clothes on one day and clothes shrink. Did you know that? Clothes will shrink. You take care of them. You do. You follow all the instructions, but somehow they still shrink. And I went to put this jacket on, man, and this jacket was, it wasn't fitting like it used to fit. But I realized I'm getting older 
and your body changes as you get older, and that's just what it was. Had nothing to do. See, this is how, this is how we justify temptation. Had nothing to do with the hostess in the pantry. It just had to do with I'm going through changes. It's just my body. It's the way it works. The clothes, the cheap clothing, they don't fit. I need more expensive clothing. Right? We justify our temptation. My, my pantry was full of it. Cupcakes, orange cup, those orange cupcakes. My God. I haven't found it yet, but there is, that's, I guarantee you, manna in the Bible when they said, what is it, was orange cupcakes. I'll guarantee you. And so, so it's riding my natural desire. Temptation is riding my natural desire, and I'm feeling the effects with it because I keep bringing it to the pantry. I can't blame Kim for it. I'm the one out there buying it. I'm the one putting it in front of me. I'm the one that's indulging in it. I'm the one that refuses to say no when I open the door. And there it is. Oh, well, you know, it's four o'clock, so I might as well eat a, 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 a cupcake. I might as well. I might as well indulge in it. The devil uses Jesus' ability. He tempted him with his ability to feed himself. Be careful when you get hungry. Have you ever went grocery shopping when you're hungry? Don't. Go eat. Go to a buffet and then go grocery shopping. I promise you, your bill will be light years different. Because when, when you are hungry and you're grocery shopping, you won't even go to the fruit and veggie section. You know, like that doesn't even exist in a grocery store. Take me to the cereal. Oh, Lucky Charms, get me some fruity pebbles, get me some fruit loops, get me some frosted, get me some, I don't want none of that healthy stuff. You know, give me anything that's frosted, put it in my cart, put it in my cart. And then let's go down the snack aisle, put it in my cart, put it in my cart. Let's go down the bread aisle. Thank God. He said, I, will I, I gotta have bread. That's in the Bible. So I gotta have lots of bread, lots of bread, lots of bread. So you start putting all this stuff. Why? Because you're hungry. Be careful. What happens when you're hungry? What are you hungry for today? What is that natural desire that your stomach's rumbling for right now as I'm talking? Natural desire. Might be a cupcake. Might be something totally different. See, maybe you're hungry for this. So you live your life. We are so obsessed with social media even when we don't have our phones, this is how we see our interactions with people. Like you'll have a conversation with somebody and wondering, are they hitting like button right now? This conversation, do they like me? I mean, do I, I, do I, and, and we'll post stuff to get likes and we'll go back and check it to see if we got more likes and more likes. And then if we put a picture up and it gets likes, oh my goodness. And then we're, we're really fulfilling our purpose. If we get a couple of these on there, now I am somebody. And man, if they like that, what if I take off a couple more layers of clothing? Then they'll probably like that a little bit better. So I'll take off a little bit more and take off a little bit more. And hold on. Oh, hold on. What's culture upset about today? I'll put a post about that. Then everybody will like it because everybody's flowing in culture right now. Everybody's upset with this. So I'll just jump in the flow with everybody else because I'm living for likes. I'm li I'm, this is what feeds me. If it didn't feed you, you wouldn't check it 45 times every hour. Some of you can go longer without food than you can without social media. And we're living for this. And my goodness, God forbid we say something and we get one of these. Hold on, Blake. When I was preaching that message, did I get these or did I get one of these? Oh, I got one of these. I better change my message. I better not preach on that anymore. Don't want people to be upset at me. Won't have many, many likes on my Facebook page. There was a day, look, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm not innocent from this. There was a day I was obsessed with how many likes I was getting. And I was going through, I mean, checking it every, how many likes did we get on that? Did we get any bad comments about that? What did we get about that? Did we get something nice about that? Did we get something nice about that? And then all of a sudden I realized if I live on people's praise, I'll die by their criticism. So, 
So here's what happened. If I got these, I was having a good day. Good day. But the moment I got one of these, oh, everything's falling. We got to change everything. The whole church is falling apart. Watch your attitude when you get on social media and when you get off of it and see if it changes. It is for this reason that I cut it out of my life. I said, hold on. This is a temptation to see if people like me or not. I don't need people to like me. All I need is God to love me. All I need God, all I need is God's approval. I don't need people's approval. Give me God's approval. What are you hungry for? You're not yourself when you're hungry. Some of you are hungry for this. Got a little curl going on today. Look at that. I've been straightening my hair. I'm not straightening anymore. I'm letting it curl. Look at that. Kim likes it. I don't care if you like it. Look good. Look, man, I look clean today. Wouldn't it look silly to walk around like this all the time? You look good. Hey, you, you would never. Would you do that? Would you go to work like this? Looking good, walking into work. I went to lunch, look at me. You would never do that. People would be calling psychiatric institutes saying, we got a great candidate for you. They walk around talking to themselves in a mirror. You wouldn't do that, would you? Would you do this? Look good today, woke up like this. Eating lunch, trying to veggie shake. <laughs> you wouldn't do that with a mirror, but now that you've got your little phone, see, here's the reason you keep taking pictures of yourself is because you love you. Let's, let's take it to another level. You worship you. That's why you got to see yourself all the time. It used to be, if only I could see God. God, show me your glory. Now you walk around saying, show me my glory. What? I'm not mad at you. I love you. I'm just trying to help somebody live the limitless life. Live the limitless life. I want you to live a limitless life. We don't care what you had for lunch. Good for you. Good for you. We don't care that your hair curled perfect today. Good for you. There, are, there is more going on in this world than I'm feeling pretty. <laughs> Duck face. <laughs> one day, one day historians are going to look back at this moment in our existence and say, culture tried to make themselves look like a duck. That's what we're going to look back. So why, why are we addicted to these things? Why, why are these things feeding us? I'll tell you why. It's all because of what Satan asked. If you are. The reason we need everybody's compliments and likes is because we don't know who we are. See, if I know who I am, I don't care who you think I am. If I know who I am in Christ, if my identity is in Jesus Christ, whether you like me or not isn't going to affect my day. I know who I am. I got to hurry. Let me, let me go quickly. I got to say, you got to share with you this point. I got 15 minutes. I got to wrap this thing up. If you are the son of God, does that sound familiar? It sounds familiar at Easter. Do you know why? Because this phrase will be used again verbatim at the cross. The Pharisees will walk up to Jesus at the cross and they'll look at him and say, if you are the son of God, come down from that cross. Think about this. Could it be the temptation when he's in a good moment that he overcame, helped him withstand the trial in a bad moment? Could it be the temptation you resist today will give you the strength to endure the trial tomorrow? If Jesus comes down from the cross, you're not saved. 
But because he said no when it was just stones being turned into bread, he was able to say no when they said come down from the cross. Here's the big idea. Could there be a father in the room today that's saying no and his children will be saved because of it? Could there be a mother in the room today saying no and your children will find strength to stand when they're faced with the same temptation? Could you be getting your victory today for somebody else's victory tomorrow? Verse 5, And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And said to him, to you I will give all this authority and their glory. Authority and glory. Authority and glory. Isn't that what we all want? Power and fame. Authority and glory. The devil's always, he's never changed his tactics. I mean, thousands of years. It's the same thing. Authority, glory, power, fame. And I will give this to you. It's been delivered to me. I give it to whom I will. If all you got to do, all you got to do. Is just bow down and worship me and it'll all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. Lust of the eye, temptation of possessions. It is the promise that always takes more than it offers. This is the lust of the eye, wealth, wealth. Don't ever compromise your standards for what somebody offers you. You'd have more people in your church, Pastor Eric, if you'd just stay away from these topics. I mean, I mean, Pastor Eric, if you really did, if you didn't fight for a diverse church, if you didn't fight for, for uh, against racism, if you didn't fight against that stuff, you'd have a much bigger church. I refuse to compromise what God has called me to do for what somebody is offering me that'll end up taking more than it ever gave. The question is, what's the price for your worship? For some of you, the price of your worship is a little bit of overtime on Sunday. That's all the devil's doing. You don't need to go to church. Just work a little overtime. Well, that one went a long way. I've watched people take jobs in other states because they made more money and the moment they took the job their whole family got out of church so was the was the open door was that an open door from god or was it an open door from the devil because he can he'll give you fame he'll give you fortune he said i'll give you power i'll give you authority just i just want to know what the price of your worship is you want to know the easiest way to determine the price for your worship Just watch whenever the pastor or whoever else takes the offering. I can see the price of your worship. You trust your money more than you trust God. I dare you to trust God with your wealth. If you don't trust God with your wealth, you can't trust him in any other area of your life. Because the Bible says where a man's treasure is, that's where you'll find his heart. Your heart is led by your treasure. When it's all about keeping and getting, I know who has your heart. But when it's all about give it, give it. God, what do you want me to give? God, how much you want me to sow? God, what do you want me to give? God, you want me to give 10 and you want me to give an offering on top of that? I'll give everything because God, you have my heart. God, you have my worship. The devil can't buy my worship, God. Because you bought my devotion on a cross 2,000 years ago. And whether you gave me another dollar for the rest of my life, I will love you. For the rest of my days. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. That includes the local church. You don't have to love this church to give to it, but you cannot love this church without giving to it. Let's go further. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Of the what? What is the temple? House of God right? Takes him to the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Pay attention. Never one time did the devil's temptation take Jesus lower. Every time the devil tempted him, he elevated him. He lifted him up. 
Man, the devil knows how to play on your pride. This is the pride of life. He will command his angels. Hold on, watch what he wrote. Verse 10. For it is written. This is the devil. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Position, status, elevation. The devil's elevating him. Notice, pay attention to this first. When Jesus whipped the devil with the first temptation, what did he say? It is written. When Jesus whipped the devil at the second temptation, what did he say? It is written. When the devil comes to Jesus with the third temptation, what does he say? It is written. God is omniscient. It means he knows everything. You can't teach God something. The devil is not omniscient. It means he learns. And let me tell you, he's studying you. If you whipped him two times one way, he will come at you using what you used against him, and he will turn it on you. Hold on. You whip me two times saying it is written? I'll come back the third time and tell you it is written. The devil knows the Bible better than you do. And he knows how to manipulate the scripture just enough so you can't see him hiding behind it. And this is what he does here. It's written. You can give in to it because it's in the Bible. You can do it. It's in the Bible. It's written. Devil's so smart. And here's what he does. These rattlesnakes, they, they had a spike of rattlesnake bites in Texas. And they couldn't figure out what was going on. So scientists began to do a study. And what they found out was that this invasive species of wild boar, they were multiplying. Wild boar feed on rattlesnakes. And the wild boar were finding the rattlesnakes and they were eating them and they found them. They don't have good eyesight. They have good hearing. They found the rattlesnakes by the rattle. And whenever they hear the rattle, they would hunt out the rattlesnake and they would eat it. So the rattlesnakes got smart and stopped rattling. And guess what? People started walking up with no warning and the snake would bite them. What I'm telling you is the temptation that's rattling today may not rattle tomorrow. You better be led by the Spirit. You better know what the Holy Spirit is saying. And you better know but the voice. You may say it's written, but I heard the Holy Ghost say on the inside of me, that may be okay for somebody else, but it's not okay for me. Where did the devil take him to fall? Pay attention. Where did the devil take him to fall? The house of God. You mean the devil took him to church to fall? I thought if the devil wanted you to fall, he'd keep you out of church. No, sometimes the devil lets you get in so that when you fall, you blame the church for your failure. And here's what happens. Uh, this is why we got to pray, God, give us, give us a spirit of discerning. Give us a discerning spirit. Because the easiest of places to fall is the place where you let your guard down. Here's where we make the mistake. We think everybody in church is a Christian. You think everybody in here saved. There are some people that the devil planted in this house to take you down. And if you don't have a spirit of discernment, you will think their compliment is there to build you up when it's really there to entice you into a relationship you were never supposed to be in. Am I helping anybody today? Here's a big idea. Satan has assigned certain people to feed your weakness. There are people that the devil will put in your life that'll say, you want a cupcake? It's okay. Oh, how about this? I'll eat one too. And then we'll both eat a cupcake together. Then you won't feel bad because you're not the only one eating a cupcake. The devil will put people in your life that will try to lead you into bad habits and lead you into bad relationships and lead you into sinful lifestyles because they're, they're there to. All, the, all they exist to do is feed your weakness. This is why you can have a person in a church who has a lying spirit and without even introducing them, they will somehow find every other person in the church with the same lying spirit. Why? Because they feed off each other. They're like spirits and like spirits attract. 
So they're attracted to people who are dealing with the same temptation they're dealing with and they get together so they can begin to feed each other. Your weakness will be drawn to any friendship that accepts it, enjoys it, and feeds on it. When somebody affirms your sinful lifestyle and they don't convict your sinful lifestyle, this is what Paul talked about when he talked about teachers having itching ears. I got to get into this. My goodness. Give me, I'm, I'm, I'm a little over time. I got three minutes left. Apostles, prophets, uh, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Every gift that Paul called the fivefold ministry has conviction inherent in it, except for one teaching. Teaching is for the edification of the saints. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, and the pastor, they have conviction when they're moving in their anointing or their calling. The teacher is edifying the body of believers. But because there's no conviction in the teacher, what do we have fulfilling a majority of the pulpits in America? Teachers, because there's no conviction. You can continue in your sinful lifestyle and never feel convicted about it. This is why people, when they get into a church where there is an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, or a pastor, they get their feelings hurt and run to a church that has a teacher. Because rather than dealing with the sin and temptation, they want to find somebody because they got an itching ear. Am I preaching today or what? Probably getting some mean faces on Facebook. So why the temple? Why did he take him to the temple to jump off? Why did he say if you jump off the temple, the angels will come and catch you? Because what he was tempting him to do is use your gift for your glory. When I preach, I don't preach for my glory. When you sing, you don't sing for your glory. I don't preach for your applause. I appreciate it, but I don't, I don't preach for it. The only applause I preach for is God's applause. Everybody else may be mad at what I'm preaching, but if God's applauding what I'm preaching, that's the only thing that matters. And have you ever noticed, let me, maybe you caught, maybe you caught this, maybe you haven't. Have you ever noticed the devil never tempts you to be like the devil? If he had all this power, why wouldn't he tempt you to be like him? If he was doing it right and he had it all, if he, if he was all good, why wouldn't he tempt you to be like him? Why did he come to Adam and Eve? Why didn't he come to Adam and Eve and say, eat like the fruit, eat the fruit and you'll be like me? Why did he come to Adam and Eve and say, eat the fruit and you'll be like God? Because he always wants to tempt you with something you've already got. You're already created in the image and the likeness of God. The devil can't make you any more like God than you already are. So why are you falling prey to his tricks? Here's what we're doing. It's just, it's just a ho-ho. I mean, is it really that bad if I just... You're still hungry? All right, hang on. All right, hang on, here we go. Maybe this will fill you up. Is that good? You, you full? You're still hungry? Okay, hold on. Hold on, let me get a little bit of this money. Here we go. How about a little bit of this? Okay, hold on. Hold on, you want more? You're still hungry? Okay, man, I'm exhausted. I'm burned out. I don't know why I'm so burned out. Because I keep feeding this temptation, thinking that it'll finally be satisfied. But it seems like the more I give it, the hungrier it gets. It seems like the more I give into it, the hungrier it gets. It gets a bigger appetite. It gets a bigger hunger. Because that's what the devil won't tell you about sin and temptation. Sin will take you further than you ever wanted to go, cost you more than you could ever pay, and keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay. That's sin. The problem is we think this is somewhere outside of us when the truth is this is what's on the inside of me. 
so I can't satisfy his appetite. So what do I need to do? I need to starve the beast and feed the spirit. I need to be full of the Holy Spirit. So when he starts growling, the Holy Spirit says, no, we got this. When he starts getting hungry, the Holy Spirit says, no, you can withdraw all things. You're an overcomer through him that loved you and died for you and gave yourself for you. Look unto him who was tempted in every way, but yet without sin. And if you'll trust Jesus, he'll open up a way and he'll make a way out so you don't have to give in to temptation. Somebody give Jesus a big prayer. Hallelujah! Stand your feet with me if you will. Thirteen. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed on him, watch, until an opportune time. You can get victory today and that devil show right back up tomorrow. This is why you have to walk and be led by the Spirit. Jesus, though, verse 14, returned in the what? Power of the Spirit. Now, he's driven into the wilderness led by the Holy Spirit. But when he comes out, he's walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Where did he get his anointing? In the wilderness. Where did he get his anointing? By starving temptation. By saying no every time the devil put an opportunity in front of his face. He said no. There's more in front of me than anything you have to offer me. And I'm not going to sacrifice my purpose. I'm not going to sacrifice my anointing. I'm not going to sacrifice my dreams or my calling or my vision for the temporary temptations of my flesh. No, there's something greater. There's something greater. I'm hungry for something greater. You want to know what I want more than temptation? I want the presence of God. I want the power of God. I want the anointing to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. But the only way I get it is if I endure, resist, flee. Temptation. was a little boy his mom put him into bed a couple hours later she heard ran upstairs he had fallen out of the bed next night same thing a few hours falls out of the bed this went on for several nights finally after about the fifth night of falling out of the bed the little boy looked up and he said mama why do I keep falling out of the bed and she said because you're not far enough in If you want to see how close to the world you can get and still go to heaven, it ain't going to be long. You're going to fall right back out into the world. But if you see how far away from the world you can get and get into the purpose and the calling of God for your life. See, that's what I'm preaching. I want a limitless life for you today. I don't want you falling out, falling out. Come back to church. Get right. Fall out, fall out. Come back to church. Get right. No, I want you to get saved to the bone. I want you to be saved, stay saved until God calls you home. That's the limitless life. Hostess. So, here I am. I decided I need to eat better. I would open my pantry and there would be all these hostess boxes. And I would say, I'm going to flee temptation. And I would shakenly shut that door back. But then one day it clicked. I don't have to overcome the cupcakes if the cupcakes aren't even in my pantry. Do you get what I'm saying? See, some of you are having to overcome things you brought into your own life. If you have an issue with pornography on your phone, instead of getting your phone out and saying, oh, I'm going to resist temptation today, get rid of a phone that can get on the internet, get you an old analog smartphone with the big buttons that all it does is make phone calls and you won't be tempted to look at pornography on your phone. 
if you've got a group of friends that every time you get around them they start gossiping and talking bad and you're like well i gotta resist i don't want to get in that conversation maybe instead of overcoming the temptation maybe you should find you a new set of friends who won't stand around and gossip and talk about things they shouldn't be talking about what i'm telling you is you don't have to overcome temptation if you block it before it ever gets there If when something comes on the television, you gotta pray to get victory, cancel the channels on your television. Right. If that's what it takes for you to live free, right. if that's what it takes for you to walk in your purpose, right. if that's what it takes for you to walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit and miracles break out all around you, then I will deny the flesh so the Spirit can live. If you're in this room today and you've been battling temptation, I'm going to ask you to come down to this altar. Now let me say again, I'm not just talking about sexual temptation. I know that's the first thing we think about. There are all sorts of temptation. You've been tempted to give up. You've been tempted to quit. You've been tempted to give in to hate and give in to anger. You've been tempted to give in to division. Some of you are giving in to food addictions you're addicted to food watch every time you're happy you eat every time you're sad you eat that's an addiction get free from it get, get victory over it there's temptations with your with yourself you're obsessed with yourself get victory over that today there's temptations with money and you're you're, you're defying the will of God in your life because of a paycheck get victory today if that's you, I'm going to pray and we're going to experience freedom at this altar. So I want you to right now step out of your seat. They're going to sing. I want you to meet me down here at this altar right now. Come on. Come on. Don't worry what anybody thinks about you. Come on. 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 Come on.